to figure out whenever I'm going to start worship, right? Let's give her a hand. <laughs> she is just wonderful at figuring out whenever, you know, it might be five minutes late, it might be on time. Whenever we start, it is a good time to worship God, and I'm glad you are here worshiping with us. Today is kind of dreary outside, but it's still a beautiful day to worship together. It's also a beautiful day to test out some fellowship time. So we are going to try that out today. Last week I was saying that if the weather's not nice, it's not going to, we're not going to be um, having fellowship. But guess what? I didn't know the CDC would be making some new decisions. So Today, you're welcome. If you brought a um, lawn chair, or if you'd like to, if you feel more comfortable, you're welcome to eat outside for fellowship, but you're also welcome to be in our fellowship hall. Um, and so we have some snacks being prepared right now uh, by Jeff Friel and maybe also Jonathan. And, um, and then we'll have some fellowship time. We'll just test it out and experiment together. So let's, let's try some new things today. A couple more announcements before we get uh, rolling with some beautiful worship. Next, next two Sundays are next, yeah, next two Sundays are gonna be a little different. We're gonna have some fun the next two Sundays. Next Sunday is not the last Sunday in the month, but it is going to be Communion Sunday. So we're going to celebrate Communion next Sunday because it is also Pentecost Sunday. So we'll remember and we'll read the story from Acts 2 when um, the Spirit came and made herself known to the very first church. The following Sunday is Graduation Sunday, and it will be May 30th. It will be a service really dedicated around five, and you heard me right, five graduates in this community who are loved by this community. Um, I won't be here, unfortunately. I'm very sad, but I get to watch online um, from Colorado where I will be. And so I'll be worshiping online in spirit and uh, Verna Bowie is going to be giving a message and she'll also be helping recognize the graduates. So next two Sundays will be very fun. I hope that you will come and worship with us. Before we get to the next two Sundays, we have a couple meetings this week. Tomorrow evening, education will meet at 7 o'clock as we just make some final last-minute plans for our graduation Sunday and discuss a few other items. And then this Thursday, we just called a meeting for 6.30 on Thursday night for worship. Worship committee will meet this upcoming Thursday. We've got a couple things to discuss with um, mask mandates and no mask mandates and lots of new things. So yay, I hear some yays. Let's hope new and um, exciting things are in our midst. Uh, one more announcement. This Wednesday night is our final worship on Wednesday until the fall. So you can watch um, worship online this Wednesday. Then we'll take a break for the summer. Our youth group will be gathering here in person for our final Wednesday night until the fall. We'll be having a bonfire. So if you're a kid at heart, you're welcome to join us. Um, we'll be enjoying some s'mores. Those are a lot of announcements. Anything I missed? Yes. Women. We are meeting Thursday at 1 o'clock. Thank you, Doris. Yeah. That's on my calendar. I won't miss it, hopefully. <laughs> Wonderful. United Methodist Women will be meeting this Thursday at 1. Anything else? Wonderful. Well, let's begin worship together as we find um, a grounding in our centeredness in this quote today from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's helping us consider what it means to live a post-resurrection faith, this sermon series we've been working through. 
since Easter. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, I discovered later, and I'm still discovering right up to this moment, that it is only by living completely in this world that one learns to have faith. By this worldliness, I mean living unreservedly in life's duties, problems, successes, and failures. In so doing, we throw ourselves completely into the arms of God, taking seriously not our own sufferings, but those of God in the world. That, I think, is faith. Amen. Will you join me in our call to worship this morning? Meet us, O Christ, in the stillness of morning. Move us, O Spirit, to quiet our hearts. From the discords of yesterday, resurrect our peace. From the discouragements of yesterday, resurrect our hope. From the weariness of yesterday, resurrect our strength. From the doubts of yesterday, resurrect our faith. From the wounds of yesterday, resurrect our love. From the uncertainties of yesterday, resurrect our praise. Meet us, Holy Spirit, and fill us with the joy of God. Enter this new day with us as we awaken to your grace. Amen. Before we sing our first hymn, I forgot another announcement after today. We've got a couple things going on. So you can join us for fellowship. After a few minutes of fellowship, a few of us will be in here discussing how to use some of the technology, this camera and our iPad. So if you want to learn how to use this technology um, and help us each Sunday morning, just stick around after worship today and we'll have a small training session of us in here. Um, also, good morning and welcome to those worshiping with us online and anyone who is worshiping with us in the parking lot. We're glad you're here with us. Let's begin worship as we sing and proclaim this beautiful hymn. It's Lift Every Voice and Sing. You may stand if you are able as we sing.
Please be seated. Hi, Jerry. How are you? I'm fine. Good. <laughs> Did you have anything you'd like to share? Sure. Positive. Huh? Positive. Okay. Sounds good. You're welcome to sit. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We have um, many prayer requests that we continue to keep in our uh, prayers, our weekly prayers, and I'll share those now. And then if anybody wants to share their own, they are welcome to. We continue to lift up Nancy Doral, who uh, has been receiving hospice care at home, and we pray that she will experience comfort and be free from pain as she receives that care. We continue to pray for folks in our community who are healing and recovering from recent hospital stays and also folks who are loved by uh, our community. These folks include Mo Gilkison, Cleo Mahoney, uh, which is Pat Eighty's sister, Joe Provo's daughter, Shirley, uh, that also includes Janice and Ardeen's son-in-law, Mark, who has been receiving care at the VA hospital after um, experiencing a brain bleed. And it also includes Don Hyatt's cousin, Jeff, who had some heart issues and blood clots after uh, COVID-19. So we continue to pray for those folks in their healing and in their care and in their recovery. And we also lift up the many students and teachers who are experiencing the beginnings of a new uh, transition as a school year comes to a close. And um, for many who are graduating, um, for them and their new beginnings that are on the horizon. Any other prayer requests that you'd like to lift up, Janice? I just report that they didn't send Mark home. Okay. He was so confused. He didn't know where he was at, and he was getting. Well, he made an escape down to the, down the elevator past the nurses' station, and headed out the front door and went to the dog dog. He didn't know where the bird is going. He just says, "I don't like this place. I don't know where I'm at," and he he was so utterly confused because he'd been moved around so much that Jill begged for to send him home. And when he got home, he said, I had an awful trip and I didn't think I was ever going to get to come home. Mm -hmm. And so he's a lot better now, but they- Receiving care at home. Care at home, Good. Yeah, medical care and everything, so. Thank you, okay. Anyway, we will continue to pray for him and his recovery at home. Hopefully he's in a place, a safer place, you know, yes. and more uh, familiar place where he can fully recover, at least well, recover he, well. He was very mortified and calm because he was where he, he knew and every other place had been so strange. Mm -hmm. So thank you. it's better to get the care at home. Wonderful. Thank you for that update. Other prayer requests that you'd like to lift up this morning? All right, will you join me in a moment of prayer? God of grace, together we turn to you in prayer. For it is you who unites us. You, the God that illustrates true unity within your very self as creator, redeemer, and sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You alone empower us for good, and you send us not away from the world but throughout the earth in mission and in service. For the gift of being sent into the world, we are grateful, Lord, 
And we pray for your power and guidance to send us to new places and spaces this day. As you prepare us and send us by the power of your faithful spirit, Lord, may you also open our hearts to love so that we can see and know that all people are made in your image. We pray that we too can become offerings of our very selves so that we may be your partners in transformation to strive for the full visible unity of the one church of Jesus Christ. In our preparing and in our anticipation, we pray together the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymns sing hymns today are I'll Fly Away, verses 1 and 3. That comes from the faith we sing. And then we'll sing Do Lord Remember Me. And those words are in your bulletin. Um, if you want to get up and dance, that's fine. These are some really upbeat hymns, and I hope that you will enjoy worshiping together and praising God as we sing them. Let's sing.
singing that all week. <laughs> that one or our last one. <laughs> oh. Our um, scripture today it comes from the Gospel of John. It's chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. And we've been kind of going all over the place uh, throughout scripture, throughout the Gospels and Acts, especially in the last six weeks or so. I just want to remind us that our sermon series has been about post-resurrection faith. How do we live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected and has prepared his disciples, us and those who were with him in the first century, what it means to be disciples in this time, right? What it means to be disciples without his physical presence. So we've been looking closely at different scripture that teaches us how to do that. And today we return um, to another text, a text where Jesus is found praying and we have insight into what he says. So that's where we begin today at John 17. While Jesus is praying, he said, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now that they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those who you gave to me, because they are yours. All is yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming back to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one who destined to be lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy and that my joy may be made complete in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All praise to the living word. Let's let these words sink in as we sing this hymn, It's Be Still My Soul.
us pray. Heavenly Lord, you dwell in and among us. We are one with you, and you have made us one with each other. Help us to realize and to live fully into this union that you call us into. Help us not reject each other, but to accept one another in our differences and even in our disagreements. Help us welcome one another wholeheartedly, fully, completely, in the same way we accept you. We pray that your spirit is rooted in us today as we consider the messages you want us to hear. Fill us now with the gifts of your spirit, forgiveness, compassion, and love, so that we might live as your witnesses to mercy. Amen. Soon before Jesus is arrested and taken to die on a cross, he spends time praying with and preparing the disciples as they will soon have to learn how to live in this world as faithful disciples without his physical presence among them. When we take a close look at all that Jesus has said in the last few chapters just before the crucifixion, we find evidence of his compassionate heart, his determined hope, and his grace-filled spirit that tries so hard to teach the disciples what his impending death will mean. But time and time again, the disciples struggle to comprehend his message. In his vulnerable prayer from chapter 17, Jesus makes many distinctions between the world and himself, as he determines that he is not a product of the world, and neither are his disciples. One popular interpretation of this text that continues into modern Christianity is the idea that in praying for his disciples, Jesus also prays for us and identifies that we too do not belong to the world and therefore we must not worry about what happens in the world now because why care for something that we do not belong to? Christians still today choose to hang their entire identity on this one description that we read from John 17. They decide that they do not belong to the world, just as Christ does not belong to the world. And I can empathize. When the going gets tough, sometimes it'd be nice not to worry about what happens in the world when my garage door breaks the same day that we pay off our credit card and pay what we owe to the IRS, I'm not that interested in the stressors of the world. I'm ready to escape, right? More seriously, it's not easy, it's not desirable to belong to this violent, pandemic-ridden, divided world. Some folks dedicate their entire lives, their entire careers to helping us escape from the realities of the world. Travel agents, realtors, and those who work in the tourist industry. Realtors, they want us to purchase a home that guards us from the stress of the world, right? You wanna find a home that you can go to to rest. They want us to find a home that brings us not chaos, but renewal. And we work with travel agents too, who help us take one or two week long vacations to escape from reality. Christianity also has its own set of pious people who spend their time separating from the world, escaping the limitations and the distractions of public culture from certain monks and nuns who live in monasteries and convents to all types of contemplative leaders who escape the busyness, the messiness in the world in order to find rest and renewal, and hopefully 
to find a fuller realization of what it means for them to live faithfully away from the world that they determine they do not belong to. And while Jesus prays this passionate prayer about not belonging to the world, I'm also reminded of how this prayer fits into the larger narrative of John's gospel as a whole. For both Matthew and Luke's gospels, they include early on a birth narrative detailing how Christ came to exist among a young, unmarried woman by the name of Mary. And while Mark has no birth narrative included, John's story is a bit less easy to understand. John's gospel returns us back to creation at the very beginning of his gospel. There, he claims that, or John claims that Jesus was with God from the very beginning of all creation. Jesus is then sent from heaven down to earth to share good news with the world. Jesus, for John's gospel, is not a product of a conversation between an angel and a mother. Jesus isn't spending time gestating in the womb of a human mother in this gospel. And therefore, Jesus appears less human, less a product of the world, because there is no conception or birth narrative. And as a result, the Jesus of John's gospel doesn't belong to the world, for he is God and God is outside the world, not a product of it. But I think there's still more. If we are not to belong to the world, if it is true that we are meant to escape the world, then why is it that at the end of this prayer that we read from chapter 17, why is it that Jesus then declares that he sends his disciples into the world? Why would Christ send us into a place where we do not belong or we have no interest in caring for? I wonder if Dietrich Bonhoeffer wondered these same questions. Bonhoeffer was a well-known 20th century German pastor who earned his doctorate at the age of 21 and served as an ordained pastor in Berlin, London, and in the United States for a short period of time. At the very beginning of Hitler's reign as chancellor, which began in January of 1933, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a local Berlin pastor at the time, began publicly and theologically criticizing Hitler's idolatrous and dangerous reign. Once Bonhoeffer publicly denounced Hitler's leadership while he was uh, broadcast on the radio, and his broadcast was cut off mid-air. Hitler and his leaders continued to try and silence Bonhoeffer throughout his ministry by forbidding him from public speaking or from publishing starting in 1941 at the very outbreak of the war when Bonhoeffer had returned to Germany after serving here in the States for a while. But the more Hitler's power grew, the more Bonhoeffer rebelled. He served as a messenger for a small German resistance movement and he made contacts with the British government while trying to help German Jews escape to Switzerland. In April 1943, while supporting German Jews attempting to escape, Bonhoeffer was arrested, where he served for a year and a half in prison. Meanwhile, Bonhoeffer contemplated his pacifist or his nonviolent values, and while in prison, Bonhoeffer assisted others in plotting an assassination of Hitler on July 20th, 1944, which you like we know, failed. After this failed assassination attempt, Bonhoeffer was then transported to a higher security prison, and less than a year later, only five months before the end of the war, Bonhoeffer was executed by the German government. Dietrich Bonhoeffer spent his entire life dedicated to the work of ministry. He announced at age 14 that he wanted to study theology, and he went on to study scripture for the entire 39 years that he lived on earth. He knew and he grappled with scripture every day, 
And his faith continues to inspire and move Christians still today. But he made some really essential decisions concerning his faith that cause us to question his understanding of the Christian life, or at least cause us to question how he interprets passages like ours today from John 17. If we do not belong to this world, why would Dietrich spend his entire life working on fixing the world? Why not look away from the evil and the violence? Why not ignore what happens to those German Jews? Dietrich wasn't one of them. He was a Christian. If the world as we know it will end someday soon, why is it that Bonhoeffer was so convinced that his work of undermining Hitler's reign had anything at all to do with his call to ministry? These are the questions I have for him. And of course, I can't answer for Bonhoeffer, but I can restate his words that I think answer some of these questions from the same quote that we read just a few moments ago in the centering moment. Bonhoeffer writes, I discovered later and I'm still discovering right up to this moment that it is only by living completely in this world that one learns to have faith. Why live completely in a world that we do not belong to? Maybe it depends on what part of scripture we choose to focus on. We could focus not just on what it means to belong, but realize that just a few verses later, Jesus says he sends the disciples into the world. Perhaps that means that it's not Bonhoeffer wants to live completely in a world where he does not belong, but he wants to live completely in a world that Jesus sends him into. I also wonder how we might rethink what it means to belong. For Bonhoeffer, he wasn't controlled by the world. He didn't find his purpose or his belonging from the world. He found himself and his purpose tied to Jesus Christ, to the ultimate example of peace found in the world and in scripture. If Bonhoeffer found his identity in the world, Maybe he would have been a preacher who served the German military at the time of Hitler's reign, uplifting violence and oppress oppression against Jews rather than being a preacher for and among the Jews in the trenches of their suffering. Likewise, perhaps we too do not need to find our meaning, our purpose, our worth in the world surrounding us. But maybe we find our purpose in a loving and forgiving God who sends us into the world so that we can offer the care and compassion that Christ's physical hands no longer can after his resurrection and ascension. We do not belong to the world. The world doesn't own us. Like Bonhoeffer, who found his mission in God against the evils of the world. We are called into the world as we are sent into it. And I think we can apply this interpretation to multiple identities of ours as well. For example, in both our personal lives and in our church community, we do not need to live searching for our purpose and our worth by the world's standards. We only need to search for God's purpose, found within our very selves and found also among the community that is known as Centennial United Methodist Church at Ivy. Jim Palmer served for many years as the lead pastor at a mega church in Brentwood, Tennessee. After serving for many years, he had a falling out and he left the church, he left his faith, and he left his marriage. He had to rebuild himself back up from the dust as he discovered that his teachings about God within this megachurch no longer fit into his understanding of what it means to be sent into the world to serve the world. This past week, Palmer published a list of mistakes that he made as a megachurch pastor. And here's what he said. Here were a few of the things on his list of mistakes. 
He said he put church over community. He put orthodoxy or rigid rules over love. He put certainty over wonder. He put polished over real. He put explanations over empathy, membership over friendship, holiness over humanity, appearance over authenticity, charisma over compassion and reputation over risk, and so much more. And I'm not personally an expert on megachurches, so I'm not going to try and make some sweeping statement about all megachurches, although I'd probably like to. However, in my experience, that's another sermon. <laughs> However, in my experience, churches and individuals who spend more time concerned with what the world expects of me or us rather than what our loving God expects from me or us, find themselves in what I think is a similar situation to Palmer. The world wants us to put certainty first before wonder, right? Because certainty feels more comfortable. We can control certainty. Societal expectations determine that polished presentations are more successful than raw, real, vulnerable conversations or lectures because it's more professional, it's more controlled. The world loves to make lists, set boundaries, determine who's in and who's out because it's easier than the messiness that comes from raw relationships that require forgiveness when we think we can't forgive anymore, that require vulnerability, vulnerability that we believe might break us. So it is up to us, as individuals and the church, to determine how we want to not be owned by the world, but to be sent into it, to be sent into the world, to love with wonder rather than certainty, to serve with authenticity and compassion rather than expectation and a focus on reputation, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, through risky friendship that may not always be polished or professional, but has the potential to be joyful and truly faithful. May it be so. Amen. We extend our time of worship now into a time where we offer our gifts and our tithes and our resources. So as you do this, take a few moments to rest, to pray, to offer, and to also listen. Thank you. 
power and guidance of your Holy Spirit, gracious Lord, that the world can be transformed. We place our gifts and our tithes into this offering today, asking for your blessing and for your mercy. May these gifts not only receive the gift of your blessing, but may they then be extended as signs of your hope that share the good news of Jesus Christ, who calls us to become neighbors to everyone we meet. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to stay standing if that helps you dance, because I promise you're going to want to dance at least once this morning. Maybe. Let's sing and maybe dance this hymn, It's, it's Me, It's Me, O oh Lord. circle. We'll sing our uh, song and then we will go out with a blessing. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit send us into the world once again today as we serve all of God's children with fewer expectations in order to serve with more joy and more empathy. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.